Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, I'm going to tell you about distributed NFE and the challenges it poses for OpenStack. Apologize for the croaky voice I spent last evening shouting too much. So, um, what is network functions virtualization? Um, I'll describe that to you. Um, those familiar with networks will recognize the situation on the left-hand side of this diagram, which is how we run networks today, that you have an appliance, and it does one thing, so a firewall. Um, and if you want another function, say a, a media converter, a media gateway, you have to install another appliance. Um, and it can't be anything else. And there's lots of logistics, you know, to install those boxes. If you're going to install them on a global network, you could plan to take a year or two years to install um, those sort of boxes ar around, the, around the globe. Um, and, yeah, there's lots of, yeah, lots of issues with, with that. So, uh, what we said with network functions virtualization is why do we need to do it that way? Why do we need to install all this physical stuff? Why don't we just run them as software on standard servers on the right hand side of, of this diagram? Which the sort of thing you'll be familiar with, so I don't have to explain the advantages of that. It's kind of the cloud model. Uh, so I've made all the vendors' boxes disappear there, and then I'll run in the software on the right-hand side, and lots of, lots of advantages there. Um, and to the IT folks in here, they said, what's the big deal? But to the network folks, this is a very big deal. This is changing the model of the way we deploy things in networks very significantly. So I call running networks today, installing physical appliances, it's like playing a game of Tetris. You've got all these different shapes of the sizes of boxes, and you've got them continuously trying to stack them into your network. Uh, whereas with the cloud model, it's much more uniform and much easier to adopt to growth and flex as, 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 as demands change. Uh, and the bit that's important for OpenStack there is, 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 is the, it's where you see those spinning wheels, the cogs that makes the automation, the installation of that software into the network. Is, of course, OpenStack has a, has a role to play there. And you might be wondering what I mean on the bottom there. I'm comparing networks today a bit like Victorian machinery. Um, and kind of where we've got to with NFE today is kind of like the PC with the green screen. And where we're trying to get to in the future is kind of this advanced holographic display that allows you to select functions you want in your network instantaneously. So why use OpenStack for NFE? Well, you see the, the architecture diagram on, on the, on the left-hand side um, there. Uh, I won't go into all the details of that, but you should recognize, you know, the bottom left-hand corner should be very familiar to you. We call that NFE infrastructure, but to you guys, that's just, just infrastructure with the usual storage, compute, and, and, and networking there. And on the right-hand side, we have the management components. So the virtual, virtualized infrastructure manager, we call that the VIM, is essentially what, is essentially what OpenStack is, 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 is a VIM from our point of view. And you can use other components of, from OpenStack in the VNF managers and the orchestrator as well. But most of the con area we concentrate on is, is the VIM there. And when we came up with this architecture, which is now you know, about, about three years old, you know, it was always assumed when we were drawing that diagram called with, with the VIM in that OpenStack would be one of those candidates. Um, and we didn't want to reinvent OpenStack, you know, so we didn't, so, so, you know, we really wanted to reuse as much as possible and not go out and invent new stuff. But the big question is, are the differences between NFV and cloud too large a gap for OpenStack to bridge? And there's been lots of debate, and this is, uh, I'm bringing some of issues up in that area, and other people have been debating that this week as well. And that's very key. And the thing you've got to be aware of is you've got to be aware of the use cases you, you're using for NFE as to whether OpenStack applies to them. So distributed NFE, let's, let's tell you a bit about distributed NFE. Unfortunately, it's known by various names, which is kind of an indication of, of, how, uh, of the, how early this and immature this technology is. Some, some people call it virtual enterprise CPE, and I tend to call that um, in, in BT virtual enterprise CPE because we're virtualizing the CP that belongs to the enterprise customers. And some people will also call it the universal CP or the UCPE because it's, it's a server you put on the customer premise that you run uh, virtual appliances on things like firewalls, routers, uh, over, over gateway functions, WAN accelerators, that sort of thing, security functions. Um, so distributed NFV means that we're putting the NFV functions right out at the edge of the network. 
So let's give you a feel for the numbers here. If, if we were putting things in the core of the network, and we'll talk about the UK network, uh, and it's a relatively small network in global terms, you might have sort of 10 or 20 locations in the core that you would typically put data centers. If we talk about the edge of the network, that could be anywhere between 100 and 5,000, depending on how you define find the edge. But in terms of customer size, it depends what you call a customer. So if we're just talking about multinational corporations, a typical multinational corporation might have a thousand branches around the globe, might have a thousand branches in, in, in the UK. So we might be talking about 100,000 sites there. So that's, each site has a server on it, so it's a compute node. So we're talking about minimum sort of order of 100,000 there. But if we're more ambitious with the with, 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 the, with this sort of solution. We could extend it into the SMB, the small medium enterprise market, and you might be talking in the order of low millions. And if you were to be even more ambitious and extend it to the residential market, people have been talking about using OpenStack for IoT, and obviously you're into the, in, into the multi-millions. So the scaling is, is, has to scale tremendously as you go towards the edge of the network. And then your next question is, well, what sort of functions do you really need to run on, on, on the edge of the network? And I, I list some functions there. And this applies to the enterprise market. You know, there's, there's functions that run out on, um, on the edge of the network that have to be implemented there. Um, so here's a, another view on, on those, how, how those deployment options. So the top diagram shows where we're deploying network functions in a service chain, which is what, you know, where, where you couple together things that you need to make a complete end-to-end -end service. In the top there, that's all delivered from the cloud, and, and you, you probably all, all get your heads around how, how, how you do that. But the next one down, we're delivering it or as purely as distributed NFV, virtualized CP, running a server on the edge. And you might say, well, why would you want to do that? Why, why isn't it okay to run everything in the cloud? So let's just give you some, some examples why you might want to do that. You might not have a data center or a provider edge or infrastructure in the country. You want to deliver services to your customers. Um, so the only location you can put your service is on the customer premise. And this customer premise can vary from being a branch site, which might be running a very low-end sort of server, might be even atom-powered or eventually be arm powered or it might be a quite a big branch a HQ or even a, a customer's data center in which case you got the full you know dual core Xeon sort of uh, dual socket Xeon type of server there and the other thing to bear in mind is that what is the network infrastructure there so in BT's case a, a good example is it's BT Brazil we got 40,000 customers in, in Brazil on the end of two megabit center satellite links so if you're on the end of a two megabit per second satellite link, you don't want to put all your compute out in the cloud because it's just going to take the delays, it's just going to take you too long to that. So you need some local compute. And that's the idea of putting a server on the customer premise, that delivering our, 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 our service. It'll be the compute on the customer premise, but we're managing it remotely. And uh, the bottom there shows a hybrid mixed model well, and this is likely to happen uh, where, where there's some functions implemented at the customer premise and some functions implemented at the cloud. And there may even be uh, functions distributed across the both in, in a cloud-like way, so whereas the customer's premise becomes part of the cloud. Uh, this shows uh, uh, the, the, the architectural components in there. On the right-hand side, we've got what we do in, in the data center end, and on the left-hand side, we have two choices. We have, we have the, the hybrid de deployment, where we put a server on the customer premise, and you can see the bits and pieces in there, the hypervisor that you'd expect, and uh, where we put in everything into the cloud, and there's no compute on, on, on the customer premises, the box very much on, on, on the left of this diagram. So, you know, when you're running something in the data center, then OpenStack's fully appropriate, and that sort of scenario we've seen Verizon and AT&T AT &T talking about recently, you know, so that, that's great. But the issues with distributed NFV is the focus of this discussion here, is when you're running it on a server, on the customer premise, it may be a single server, maybe a small server, and we're talking about potentially hundreds of thousands or more compute nodes that we have to manage. So that leads to these six challenges. I'm going to hand over to my colleagues now, so we, we, I've got three colleagues coming up, we'll talk through two of each of these, and then we'll come back to myself, and I'll summarize at the end of it. Adrian, thank you. Hey, thank you, Peter. So, 
the first of the challenges that Peter has articulated for us is to look at the issue around how you bind the network, the network devices within the guest, within the VM, with the virtual NICs that the infrastructure is going to provide. So the reason why this is a particular challenge, if you think of the type of a firewall deployment example, it's really important that, that firewall understands what's the LAN connectivity it's got versus what's the WAN connectivity. And as you can imagine, pretty bad to mix those kind of things up. So one of the things that we looked at first could we help is the consistent device naming in Linux. And this is a, a set of conventions within Linux that helps you to understand which type of device you're connected to. So if it's a, a LAN on motherboard, it's a, an EM followed by some number. If it happens to be a PCIe device, then it's P followed by the slot, followed by P followed by the number of that device. And with virtual functions, that extends further. It starts to look at the underscore followed by the number or the VF number, the virtual function number. But we're not recommending that you would rely on this method to make sure that you have this consistent allocation of your, your NICs because the administrator could change and, and it's certainly within their option. There's a capability in Linux to do that. And also, it's a requirement that this is specified on the, uh, with the kernel boot commands. And while it is the, the default, it would be pretty bad for us to rely on that kind of a default in OpenStack. So to help look at how we um, want to try and address this challenge, the first thing we, we'd say is that there's this Nova boot option with metadata. So for VNFs that support the ability to look at things like configuration drive related options and, and read the metadata as they're booting up, the uh, tenant or whoever's deploying the service can look into that virtual network function, figure out what the uh, device labels are. When they go through the typical process of uh, instantiating that machine, and you look at, you get to the point where you've created the port. Coming back from that, you get the MAC address. And what we can do with this capability then is to specify in the Nova boot command the device label that is associated with that uh, desired MAC address. And then when the VM comes to go boot up, it can go check the config drive and it can do the right mapping so it knows very predictably what type of interface you've got. The other one to start looking at is this new capability in Nova that's planned. It's called virtual guest device role tagging. And the benefit here is that even when you're running the same type of VNS, the ones that can access config drive info, we no longer need to go and figure out what the MAC address is. So it's sufficient with uh, this proposal to just add the command into Nova boot to reference the particular device label that you want, or sorry, the device tag we call in this case and associate that with the network that you want to have uh, this uh, device boot up on. And then Nova's going to go off and create the mapping and figure out what that MAC address should be to reflect the desired mapping. And when the VM boots up, it can go read the config and it can figure out what that MAC address is. But what about the case where you're looking at a VNF that can't go and look at this uh, type of config drive info and, and it has a very static view of how it wants these devices allocated? Now, in that case, What's necessary here is for us to go, uh, again, you have to go and look in at the, at the device, understand what the PCIe address that they really want these, uh, let's say, LAN or WAN to show up on. And the proposal here is that we're going to make an extension in glance around the image metadata and be able to tag with the, um, the particular device uh, uh, capability, like a WAN or, or a LAN, with that known PCI address in the guest that the virtual machine really wants you to boot it with. And then we leverage the capability I just mentioned about. You go through the boot process, and Nova is going to create the, the mapping to make sure it's using the PCI address for the guest that the guest really wants. So when the guest comes to complete the boot process, the LAN or WAN or management interface, whatever the, the one you're looking at, definitely shows up in the right location. So it hits on the predictability that's really necessary in this case. A, a related part of the problem with the binding virtual NICs is what happens when a NIC goes down. And uh, three behaviors have been observed in the environments. It, the device could show up as the same device again, which is usually OK. It could show up enumerated as a new device, like some like Ethernet 3 in this picture, in which case the VNF may, know, may not know what to do with it. Or you can end up in a case where your network function just locks up. Now, when we looked at the reason why some of these things happen, and it kind of feeds into what I'll talk about next, it's around the, the method in which these uh, devices were, uh, sort of the data model that we deployed it with. 
So there is an option to deploy with something like um, chaining uh, neutron networks together to try and create that service chain. But when you do that and you want to make a modification, you get a lot of these connect and disconnect events. So the short-term solution is to look at more of an SFC option. I'll talk to that in a moment. But longer term, and it's probably the most correct path, is we need to make sure that the VNF vendors can properly handle these type of events in a cloud environment. So looking then more at the service chain modification, part of what was set up was this idea that if you've got multiple functions, and this is before we had uh, networking SFC, um, you could use uh, neutron networks to kind of chain all of these things together. Um, you know, quite a static way of setting the thing up, but if you wanted to use a neutron interface, that was really the only option we had at the time. Now, uh, if you did want to go and make a change here, that's where you get all of these connect and disconnect events. So, um, and if you wanted to make a significant change, you could end up in a network outage of potentially more than five minutes, which you know, is terrible from a service delivery perspective. So what we started to look at is all the great work that happens in the networking SSC community. Now, networking SSC, the, there's lots of uh, talks and design sessions on that this week. It's this um, port group based method to figure out how you're going to create a service path between your various uh, network functions. Um, so what I'm showing here too is that the way it's been architected, you can have lots of different backends and lots of ways of uh, interfacing with your network. The one I'm just showing is around how to leverage OVS. So if you have Neutron managing OVS directly, you can use networking SFC to do that. So a relatively easy to consume interface, works uh, quite reliably and predictably in, for this type of uh, use case. However, we started to look at, uh, well, there's a lot of goodness in what it is today. When you look towards the IETF and the type of things that showed up in the SFC specs there, we identified a number of uh, changes that I think we'd like to make in the, uh, for the SFC for Neutron. So there's a proposal on the table now to look at how we might move that forward, do a second rev of that API. Um, if you'd like to follow the, this mailing list on it shown up here, we're, we're going to try and address features such as being able to do reclassification at different points in your chain, um, being able to contain metadata, a, a, a different way of being able to do encapsulations depending on the wireline protocol that you might want to support. Uh, and the idea here is that we're going to work with this community, uh, possibly move to a second revenue API, possibly look at taking some of the ideas we're putting forward and see how we can modify the existing API, which could itself mean a step change. But what we're really looking for here too is to say, uh, please work with us, engage with us, and understand of all these extra types of features we think might be necessary in SFC, which ones show up as the most important for you right now so we can help prioritize that work. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Tarek Khan in HP Enterprise. Thank you, Adrian. So, one of the other problems that was articulated to us was that, uh, as Peter uh, t talked about earlier, a lot of these, uh, these uh, distributed components of, of this uh, CPE deployment are at customer sites. So when they're inherently at customer site, under some cases, they may be connected directly to the provider's fabric, but in a number of other cases, they may be connecting either over the internet or someone else's fabric. And in those cases, you've got to be able to make sure that that the communication between the customer edge and, and the next hop, wherever it may be, all the way to the cloud or perhaps to the, uh, to the local pop, that needs to be, be uh, uh, protected. So in, in this one, uh, this is one of those things that uh, you have uh, some, some issues. Since we are, we are talking about a, a physical device with some, some host operating system running on it, one of the uh, shorter term options is that you use some kind of a tunnel, some encryption when, when you are shipping the, the CPE device, and most of the times carriers are the one who ship this device either directly or through their partners. So you have the, uh, one of the encry encryption endpoints on the CPE device uh, along with the host, host operating system, and you create a tunnel back. Uh, quite likely, IPsec is uh, most portable and easiest to use, but, but uh, other options absolutely are available. But for, for longer term, we need to be able to look at, in addition to having a t tunnel, how is it that we can 
we can minimize the type of traffic that travels between the CPE and, and the cloud. And uh, in the next couple of slides, we're going to go a little bit more on this, uh, this uh, different uh, federated uh, deployments where you don't have to open those 500-odd pinholes to be able to communicate and manage the, uh, the uh, remote devices. Um, the the uh, fourth challenge goes into the scalability of OpenStack. And uh, I think, you know, over uh, this session as, as well, and if you look at every session that, that uh, OpenStack goes through, the, these uh, summits, we find that uh, a single set of controllers are supporting more and more uh, compute nodes. And now we are, we are uh, for production deployments, we are, we are uh, reaching, you know, in very, very close to thousands. In test, yes, we have been able to go beyond thousand as well, compute nodes. But in this case, uh, uh, even going over to that number doesn't meet some of the requirements as, uh, as were articulated earlier. So we're looking at, uh, you know, what options could be available. And uh, as we talked about earlier, the, the OpenStack, when it started, as we are all aware, they were trying to solve the problem of, of providing infrastructure as a service, moving you know, up the layers, and, and, but doing it in the cloud. So perhaps in short term, it's not appropriate to use OpenStack to manage the edge compute device. And uh, you essentially then are delegating a lot of the features that OpenStack provides over to some kind of orchestrator. It could be uh, the, the uh, orchestrator that, that we talk about within, within the HC architecture, the NFV orchestrator. It could be a VNF manager, or it could be a yet new thing, something that uh, one of the earlier slides talked about, which is a CPE manager, perhaps a combination of some of the capabilities that VNF managers do and NFV orchestrators do, but more focused on the edge use case. So obviously some of the disadvantages are that we are talking about another new thing. And another new thing always creates the problems of what are the interfaces we are going to be using, how are we going to be working with the, with the components that are on the other side. Um, slightly uh, long or medium term options go into uh, trying to be able to use uh, OpenStack as on the edge. And, and one of the ways of doing it is to, to come up with a, a um, all-in-one or a hybrid model where you have a very lightweight control plane sitting on the, on the uh, CPE device itself. And that light, with, with the, some of the OpenStack projects, something like OpenStack Cola, which essentially enables the deployment of OpenStack services using as containers, perhaps uh, leverage something like OpenStack Cola to be able to deploy just the core services. Nova, Neutron, of course you need Keystone over there, and just the basic services on the, on the edge device, and then have the same CPU device be the compute node as well. So you're able to deploy a few, few VNFs over there. And then look into, into seeing you know, if the VNF and if the working with the VNF vendors on what kind of lightweight VNFs can be deployed, and perhaps making those available as, uh, as containers as well, as lightweight as possible. Now, in this case, uh, this, this is doable with the, uh, with the efforts that are going on today. It's just uh, a matter of being a careful design and architecture and, and some of the operational issues related to having, having, uh, trying to keep track and, and managing the, the different OpenStack instances that you're going to have, uh, which over time are going to be uh, different flavors, different versions. Um, the longer-term option uh, seems to be that uh, a solution that was I believe initiated uh, a couple of years ago, but didn't get as much traction earlier. Um, OpenStack cascading solution, uh, which became a project uh, in the last couple of years, last year, uh, called OpenStack, uh, OpenStack TriCircle. We feel that uh, this is the more appropriate and more elegant solution to be able to address this. And, and primarily being that with OpenStack TriCircle, you have the top OpenStack with the additional TriCircle components uh, deploy on it that, that provides a proxy for, for all the local open stacks that are running at each edge device. And, and this, this does, the, the, the elegance of this solution is at the top side, you're still using OpenStack API, but now you have a single API endpoint instead of your orchestrators going over to you know, thousands or tens of thousands of endpoints. And in the bottom piece, it, it uses the standard OpenStack API to communicate to bottom OpenStacks, so which uh, helps us work through the issues of, uh, be it uh, 
be it the scale that we talked about earlier, be it uh, security that we talked about earlier as well, because it's REST API commands that are going down below, and these are uh, standard OpenStack. But of course, uh, TriCircle uh, is not uh, as active as we'd, we'd uh, like it to be, so we'd encourage, uh, we, we at HP absolutely are, are, are looking to participate, increase our participation, and look for, uh, for uh, more community participation in it. For the next uh, challenge, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, uh, Arun Thulasi. Thanks, Eric. So good morning, folks. Uh, so Challenge Phi uh, is what we call startup storms. Uh, over the last few years, uh, there's been a significant increase in the number of mobile users, uh, in the way people want access to the information. But most importantly, the expectations of how uh, you'd like your service to be, the, the quality of service expectations uh, have also skyrocketed. Uh, if, if I cannot post a picture of the salad that I just had, which probably a million other people had just now, if I cannot post it onto my social network within the next 15 seconds, uh, it effectively becomes a, you know, my service provider sucks hashtag. So uh, that problem specifically gets uh, exposed uh, when you run into uh, startup stampedes. Uh, when when a pop or a, or a data center loses connectivity, uh, it impacts a number of users within that region. And when the services start to come back up, uh, we do not hesitate. I mean, we want, to, we want to refresh our request again and again in the sense the load on the infrastructure increases and uh, the patience level of, of the users decrease. So it, it is very important for a service provider to be able to address these situations so that uh, the, the kind of quality of service we have come to expect uh, can always be met. So today, uh, when, when an infrastructure goes down, uh, as the infrastructure is coming back up, the VNFs need to come back up. They need to talk to each other. Uh, they need to reconcile their status. OpenStack services need to come back up. Uh, they'll have to figure out uh, their consistency requirements. And th there are some things that we can do today with, with the options that we have, you know, a short-term solution uh, to be able to mitigate this problem. The first is dynamic uh, scaling of control instances. As the load starts increasing your environment, your orchestrator or, or your mano uh, tool that you have should be able to dynamically sc uh, scale your control instances as required. It could be for the VNFs, it could be for OpenStack services. Uh, in essence, you, you need someone who's monitoring this and he's able to respond uh, to the surge in the workload. Uh, secondly, take advantage of uh, some of the advantages that your networking protocols inherently provide you. So for instance, if you use IPv6 using neighbor discovery, you'd be able to completely work through uh, the ARP storm problem, which is also one of the scenarios uh, that could happen here. However, for long term, uh, you should be able to isolate your devices uh, to the local regions uh, so that the impact is felt only at the local level and not at the entire data center level. So we talked about uh, projects such as TriCircle, uh, which, which have a, a similar goal in mind, where I can localize critical services, specifically no one neutron services, that I can push to the edge so that the impact is not felt all the way back uh, to the power pole, to the data center. Uh, Going forward, uh, it might not apply just to no one neutron services. Uh, we should be able to scale OpenStack and every microservice within the OpenStack uh, down into every region uh, as best as we could. And lastly, because the VNFs uh, are the ones that provide uh, the actual service to the user, uh, we need to figure out a way uh, to run a hybrid uh, VCP deployment where not all your VNFs run in the data center, uh, but uh, some of the critical VNFs, you know, probably a van optimizer. Uh, any VNF that will be impacted by this loss of service also run local. In a sense, keeping the storms uh, local to uh, the center that has failed. So uh, when we first discussed this slide, you know, one of the questions we had was around, why is there a buzz there? What's, what's the point it's trying to drive? So that's from the movie Speed, actually. So, you know, you, you need to drive a bus at more than 50 miles an hour if you go slow, your bus is going to blow. You're on an isolated freeway, and then you see a huge gap. And that's the exact feel you have when you deploy your VNF, and then OpenStack says, this API is not supported. So VNFs do not have the kind of development cycles that OpenStack has. 
they cannot refresh their code every six months to meet the API changes that, you know, not, not just OpenStack, any of the other fast-growing open source communities introduce. So we need to find a way to bridge that gap for VNFs not to feel the pain, have the ability to use the latest and greatest features, you know, security features or, or something that, that matters more to them without losing uh, the compatibility that they've already had with an existing version. And for us to be able to do that, uh, there, are, there are some short-term solutions and, and, and a few other long-term solutions. First, as, as a community, we need to be able to backport critical and domain-specific features as our users desire. So uh, it's great for us to move from, you know, Metaka to Liberty and Liberty to Newton and Newton and beyond. But that does not carry the same value for a, for a VNF vendor who's already certified his code on an existing version. So if it's a critical feature that a good portion of our user base is already on, uh, we need to ensure that it gets backported uh, into that release. Uh, today, uh, within HP Enterprise, we, we have this uh, challenge as part of our partner solutions where you know, there are multiple versions of OpenStack that we need to validate on. And we, we work around it uh, by using a variety of different remote storage options. So uh, our compute nodes are essentially shells where they boot from a different storage volume based on the version of the controller that is currently under test. Uh, it, it is a circuitous solution to this problem, but it's seemingly working you know, until we can get to a stable state. And lastly, uh, as, as good as these advanced notices are, which come out saying this version is going to be duplicated, as, as developers, we keep chugging through on, on our own timeline. So there has to be a, a feature or a facility within the code uh, that activates a deprecation countdown timer that not only just you know, announces to the world that something's going to change, it's, it, it starts it much uh, earlier in, uh, in time. Uh, a long-term release option could be uh, you know, having a safe harbor release. So this is what you know, anyone who's, who's built a product is probably already doing. Uh, we provide a customer a, a long-term support or a safe harbor release with an open stack that we assure will have all the critical features. And this helps us keep the, the engine running for innovation where every new release will introduce a number of features. But a customer who's made the conscious decision to move to a long-term supported release will get all the key features that he requires uh, to ensure backward uh, compatibility. And the last is the ability to provide a, a cloud portability kit uh, that can act as uh, an overall wrapper around some of the APIs that we provide. That I'll pass it back to Peter. Uh, yes. for Thank his... you, Aaron. Yes. So let's just summarize uh, the issues and the solutions. Uh, binding network uh, interface calls to the network, virtual network function. Very important to get that wrong. Um, it, you know, it has very serious consequences. Um, you can do it today, obviously, but it's kind of error prone, shall we say, because it's dependent on you writing your, your heat script in the right sort of way. If, you, if there's some inconsistency with a new version of the virtual network function, then you might end up connecting the interfaces wrong. So definitely a concern now. So those colored bars are kind of my concern omitters. Uh, the uh, it's a red amber green coding. So I'm concerned about that today. We can see in the longer term that some of these mechanisms proposed might make, be able to turn that to, to a green status. Securing OpenStack over the internet, definitely have to be concerned about that today. Even if you think, oh, it's easy to implement IPsec, you have to be careful how that's implemented and have a think about how, how, how are you isolating all the components correctly from the internet. Um, and it's even just using IPsec, you know, then you've got to think about how you manage your digital certificates, et cetera. So, so they all these things you won't get an intern to design that sort of solution, you know, design it very carefully. Um, but with, with some of the solutions proposed, again, we can see a way of making, making uh, OpenStack more secure over the internet. Service chain modification, very important to us. You know, the whole point of, of uh, NFV is that you have this flexibility to change your service in real time with minimum downtime. FSC is essential to that, so you know, but still concerns about how it's implemented today and needs, needs a bit more management capabilities, needs a bit more flexibility. There is a, a way we can see we can go with that. Scalability of the controllers, 
um, very essential architecture thing, you know, how, how many controllers do I need to install, how do I regionalize them, do I do it per customer, etc. Um, and I need to get, you know, it, when I want to manage hundreds of thousands of nodes, I need to get really good scalability. You know, I can't have 50% I have of my infrastructure just running OpenStack. You know, it's got to, be, got, got, got to be efficient. But there are some good solutions that we can see, Curler and TriCircle there. And I think that would take us to a really good, good point if, that, if those, those are carried through. Um, the startup storms or stampedes, lots of concerns. You can do things to, to mitigate those today. But I've still got some underlying concerns, and uh, this is the experience that we get in, in, in networks all the time with network equipment, that you can, that a stampede, you do need control mechanisms around there to fix that. And I'm not, not clear that we've, we've yet got a roadmap that takes us to a solution that is guaranteed under all circumstances to recover. Backwards compatibility, I'm very unhappy with. Now let's just be clear why I need backwards compatibility. I'm talking about thousands of different customers, all with different planned engineering works. I can't get all those customers aligned to say, you got, we're going to upgrade you all in the same, same hour of, 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 of the year. You know, the different sorts of customers in different segments need, you know, some want their maintenance windows in the middle of the night, some of that's the busiest time in the middle of the night. So, so we have to be able to run the same service, different releases of the same service. Uh, and you just, you just can't do that today. Um, it may be an architectural issue. You might find some clever ways around to solve that with the architecture, but definitely one of concern today because if, if we can't upgrade our, 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 our customers, um, it's, 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 it's a real issue. So we have to be able to upgrade them, and we have to way of doing that smoothly. And today, we, with traditional network equipment, that does take up a lot of operational time, and, um, that, and that's with some of the vendors guaranteeing backwards compatibility. So without backwards compatibility, it becomes a nightmare. It's really show, showstopper. So what's the conclusion and call for action? So we've seen the several tractable and competing solutions at various stages of maturity. Um, we're making progress. It's not really quick enough. You know, network operators are all launching NFE services right now. BT has, AT&T has, Verizon has. So we, we have, to, have to move quicker. It's, I'm happy with having a limited number of competing solutions. That's not a big deal. You know, the best, the best solutions will, will win at the end of the day. Now, we need a, something very specific to happen, a specific call for action here. You know, the curl and tricircle will look to be really useful in this, giving us the scalability. Um, so that's essential to have. FSC, service function churning, essential to have as well. Uh, so those developments we really want to, want to drive. So we have to engage with the OpenStack and the OP NFV. That's, that's, uh, that's a, a, a community that's generating uh, open source solution for NFV specifically. And make these challenges more mainstream and make sure they get addressed. You're going to need continued operator engagement, and that's why I'm here and get engaging with you, because I know vendors can't solve this, this, this alone. And finally, I'm sure, you know, I've just listed six challenges here. You've heard some, you may have heard some other challenges from, from uh, Telefonica, but there's bound to be something we've missed here. So if you think we've missed something, let us know, you know get, get, get in touch, and, and we'll add it to the list of things that we need to fix. So thank you, everybody. I think we've got uh, three minutes for questions. Uh, so if the colleagues come up in case, uh, is there any questions? OK. Hello. So this is Deng Hui from China Mobile. And uh, I have questions about your uh, virtual CPU solution here. And are you doing the virtualization for the connections? I mean, the P routers, and when you do the VPN connections, or are you totally skip that? because? When we do this kind of solution, we need end-to-end -end source orchestration. And for that purpose, we need both SDN orchestrator and MV orchestrator. So I'm asking here, are you considering that? Yeah, yes. Um, so you know, our, our solution, our orchestrator, will orchestrate the physical and the virtual elements on, on an end-to-end -end basis. Um, so that's how we consider it. But I, I don't think you know, how you configure the, the, the P routers or the physical elements is, is Another question that's separate from how you manage the virtual CPA. Right. So when we do the legacy physical, I mean, configuration, we need to uh, connect to the EMS, I mean, the legacy pro, um, solutions. Uh, then we connect the legacy to the SDN orchestrator, uh, other than MV orchestrator. Yeah. So if you, so I can, if you can come tomorrow, I can present 
how we do that. Yeah, I'll come and, I'll come and look at that. Okay. Yeah, I have a second question about the subscription chaining, because I saw you have subscription chaining on the edge side. Probably you also have the narrow side. Yeah. H how can you combine these two chaining together? Yeah. I mean, two chaining, both on the edge, the other one is data center. Yes, yeah, yeah. So how how you chaining them together? Are you using uh, two VMF manager, or that's very interesting topic. I'm also present uh, tomorrow. Oh, right, okay, good. <laughs> we'll come and see that then. I'm wondering if we are not thinking about this ho more holistically, because uh, it seems like you're uh, assuming that uh, me as a customer, I'm with American Airlines, that I don't need other um, functionality at those edge locations. So in theory, if we start moving towards VDI type stuff functionality, I need a lot of more things over there. And I'm not sure for you if your CDN means content distribution network or if it means something else. Um, but we need something like file synchronization, file um, caching. We need the ability to talk to SaaS providers. So there's a lot of functionality we need. So the idea of having just these little micro instances, now I'm actually looking at, um, unless it's a really small airport or a really small reservations um, office, um, at least two beefy boxes that may have um, Intel CPUs and as Intel CPUs keep on going, those are gonna be really beefy boxes um, that have tons of functionality. Solid state storage, there's tons of things we can actually do at the edge. And I'm worried that you guys are not thinking big enough about what the value proposition of NFV is to enterprises like American Airlines. Um, because it looks like you're still trying to um, solve just the networks portion of the world and ignoring us server and mid-range and desktop guys. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's a very good comment. Um, heard, heard that many times and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to walk before I, I run. And I definitely see it evolving to that picture where we are addressing, you know, we get customers saying, can't, can't we run more of our IT capabilities on, on, on your platform and I think we'll get there. And I've got it the other way as well, when your know, customers saying, well, why can't you run your network functions on our IT platform? And I think we'll go there. And then actually, you know, I've got some customers that are doing that matter. We are running managed network services on their IT platforms and we have done that. And the other way around, we've not done that yet. You know, it's, it's early days, but I can definitely see it evolving to that, that point, yeah. Hi, okay. um, Kathy Cacciatore from OpenStack Foundation. And I, my question is, I saw one blueprint uh, link on there for the first challenge for um, PCI card tagging. Um, how are you getting these requirements into the Nova, Neutron, and Keystone, et cetera, projects? Are you, I'll turn the question around. How would you recommend we get those requirements well, <laughs> We had, had an extensive conversation about that uh, Monday. I, I, you missed, but um, we, can, we can talk about that offline. But also, I think OPNFE, um, joining OPNFE and joining with you know, AT&T and uh, China Mobile and uh, other telecoms and bringing all the requirements in together with one voice is probably a good idea. Yeah. They yeah. are working together closely with OPNFE to facilitate the processes to uh, make that happen. Yeah. All right, so you, you're, you're not, and I wondered if you, the vendors were engaging, you know, with the projects on those. Yes, very much so. I think there are multiple options that we're looking at to get these type of requirements in. Uh, there are people working, like you mentioned, the OPNFE community, and there's a lot of great work now getting that brought into what we've uh, just established in the product working group where there's uh, going to be a very specific NFE track or Trulco track where we can start looking at these things and help the, the prioritization work. There's work going directly into the various projects. Uh, like you mentioned, there, there's actually two blueprints in that uh, targeting on one of those challenges. And you'll find with lots of the different challenges, there are people going in direct that you know, are very active in the OpenStack community, so it, it makes sense to go make it happen. Uh, I think the the way of looking at these different use cases and helping to prioritize what we can do per different phase, that's an important step. Uh, it's one we have worked on in the past. I think it needs more attention because we need to be able to prioritize things on the input into these development cycles so that we're not hitting this uh, uh, big backlog at the end. Okay, let's talk. We'll talk after. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned, uh, didn't mention Mano much in the distributed architecture you presented to us. Uh, will you also think about distributing the Mano functions? That's, 
a good question. Probably, I think, yes. Yeah. Yeah, in this case, a uh, couple of ones uh, they, they, they talked about scaling and other things. Yeah, we specifically didn't go out to Mano and, and talk about, but right now the way we are looking at some of those Mano functions, which, which Etsy has not clearly articulated on how, how they relate to distributed NFE. So, so those, we are, we are right now kind of bundling them into some unnamed thing called CP manager, they, they may be, and that perhaps would be regionalized but we'll like to move the Mano functions as much to the cloud and then manage these, uh, these devices uh, from, from a remote location. Ah, okay, thank you. Okay, I think we have to move on now, otherwise we'll be running to the next speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.